I'm asked questions daily and they can help me choosing topics for my videos. In this video an answer that comes close to the universal question on stereo. How do I seek for the best sound? The question came from user MZ6LT2PR9S as a reaction on my video the preamp inside the DAC and other questions. I quote, Thanks for this video. A clear explanation to someone that isn't an EE. I would be interested in a follow up video expanding on your thoughts around source material, for instance CD and streaming, and the sampling rates of DACs. The numbers listed for the source and the DAC can be confusing. For example, 44.1 kHz for a CD and 192 kHz for a high res stream and 384 kHz 32-bit for a DAC. What do these numbers really mean in your experience? How does it affect the stereo sound you hear? In addition, how do the connections slash inputs you use RCA XLR Toslink between the source and the preamp impact the sound you hear? I have a high-end system and sometimes I can tell a difference after a lot of critical listening, but manufacturers advertise that higher numbers mean better sound, so I'm expecting it to sound better, which impacts my perception." End of quote. Perhaps a bit presumptuous, but I will attempt to give the best answer I can. Whether that will suffice, I can't say. Audio reproduction today involves many disciplines. Electronic engineering, electric engineering, information and communication technology, mechanical engineering, vibration control, aerodynamics, acoustics, electroacoustics, psychoacoustics and even brain research. There will be no single engineer that master all these disciplines. With audio engineering traditionally electronic engineers reign the field perhaps with the exception of those engineers involved in loudspeaker design. Nowadays, for instance, ICT technology has become important, a field where traditional electronic engineers had little knowledge. But ICT engineers have little understanding of high quality digital to analog conversion. And for instance how important it is for high quality audio to have the analog square waves used for transporting digital audio information as clean as possible. Even small amounts of noise or DC shift will be audible after a high quality digital to analog conversion, while in ICT technology this is hardly critical, if at all. Psychoacoustic research has been around much longer, but over the last decennium new scanner technologies makes it possible to do more research into the functioning of the brain. That's not only fantastic since it brought me deep brain stimulation to drastically reduce my essential tremor, it also caused progress in the field of psychoacoustic research. It stimulated DAC chip programmers to design FPGA programs with far higher time resolution than analog electronic engineers ever thought was needed. It also was the basis for MQA that was attacked rather unkindly and unjust by computer nerds. There is far more to say on the subject, but let's leave it at this and go to the down to earth answers. At least in theory, there should not be any difference between audio data pressed into a CD and the same audio data played through a network audio player, provided both players are capable of reproducing the same audio quality of course. But this is a paper reality. Let's look at the CD. It is a polycarbonate plastic disc 120 mm or 7 inch in diameter and 1.2 mm or 0.047 inch thick. On one side small pits are pressed measuring between 850 nanometer to 3.5 micrometer in length and 100 nanometer deep. An aluminium or sometimes gold layer is applied to it and covered by a film of lacquer. The label is printed on the lacquer and therefore this side of the disc is more vulnerable than the side that the laser scans. It rotates at 200 to 500 rpm 
on a spindle that usually is around 17 to 18 mm or 0.67 to 0.81 inch in diameter. A CD mechanism normally is closed off, but if you could look inside you could see the disc vibrating quite severely. Under these conditions the laser has to read down to 3.5 micrometer short pits in a 500 nanometer wide track at 1.2 to 1.4 meter per second, meaning 4.4 to 5 kilometers an hour or 2.7 to 3.1 miles per hour. The reading is done like with vinyl in a spiral, only from the inside out, but not divided into sectors like a computer disc. A misread has to be corrected by very advanced error correction while the information bits are not written in a serial way but spread in a way that even if you drill a 1 mm hole into the disc it will still play. But then the error correction will take time to put things right and if that fails an algorithm will calculate the most likely data through interpolation. Case Hauhammer Imink who was the mainly responsible for the interleaving technology received an Emmy award for it. Still he once told me that the CD worked by the grace of imperfection. If we for now put aside higher sampling rates, the audio files used to burn the CD masters contain the same audio bits as the WAV AIFF or FLAC file for consumer use. So you could say that the process of making a master, copying that to CD and reading the CD at home is skipped, potentially meaning that the chance on errors must be less and thus the sound quality might be better preserved. Computer media carriers like hard disks, SSDs and thumb drives all can offer far higher reading speeds than needed, so in the unlikely event of a read error the same data can easily be re-read. Read errors or worse will not get into the final bitstream to the digital to analog converters, but like with CD mechanisms, control voltages for the disk speed and read head or laser in case of a CD can cause variations in the voltage line that in turn can confuse the digital to analog conversion. Network connections can also introduce interference doing the same. See my video The BS About Network Switches and the like. Links at the usual places. A lot of urban myth stories on streamers or network players come from people that have used vinyl or CDs over a longer period, perfecting playback by upgrading to players that suit their needs. When they then buy a network player, they often don't go for the same budget as their player since they just want to try the new medium. They forget the lower budget being a most likely cause for a lower quality. Agreed the first streamers weren't up to the level as better vinyl players, not at all even, but the same was true for early CD players and they were initially criticized for their sound quality too. I suppose the early stereo vinyl players had the same, but I'm not old enough to remember since I was four years of age then. When digital audio was liberated from the CD that dictated 44.1 kHz and 60 bit sampling, some quality conscious studios started producing at double the sampling rate and 24 bit depth. During production this gave more room for things like equalizing, dynamic processing and so on. At the end of the 90s Sony introduced Direct Stream Digital DSD for short a 1 bit encoding system that uses 64 volt sampling frequency and uses noise shaping. I made a two part video on DSD, DSD explained part 1 and 2. Please watch them if you want to know more about DSD, links at the usual places. One of the ideas behind DSD was that record companies could use it to archive their recordings in the highest quality and then later could convert it back to 44.1. 88.2 or 176.4 24-bit for distribution to customers. For instance on DVD audio, a format that never really took off. But DSD is used for Super Audio CD, today still available from boutique labels. Although they nowadays sell DSD files as downloads too. Anyway, the higher sampling rates 
DSD as both archive and distribution media and the trend to play music from a computer paved the road to higher sampling rates and bit depths. Digital to analog converters, DAX for short, came to market facilitating this. Then the discovery came that dedicated streamers could sound considerably better than a computer. I still remember the legendary Chinese Aurelic Aries LE network player from 2024. It did 384 kHz at 32 bit and sounded a lot better than the popular network players of that time. About what digital interface is best, I made a video on that subject called SPDIF, TOSLINK, AES-EBU or I2S, what's the best? Do we need higher sampling rates? That's the 10,000 euro question. I'll give you my current vision on it. Feel free to think different. Let me start with the sampling rate. Sampling rates up to 384 kHz can produce better sound quality, not because files at higher sampling rate contains more information, but because higher sampling rates make it easier for the DAC or player to filter the half sampling frequency. Harry Nyquist published his theorem in 1928 named Certain Topics in Telegraphic Transmission Theory, which stands at the base of digital audio. It requires that there is no signal above half the sampling frequency. So a digital recording made at 44.1 kHz sampling frequency must not contain any information above 22.05 kHz. So a low pass filter has to be applied the so-called anti-aliasing filter. And at playback again a filter at 22.05 kHz has to be applied to prevent false interpretation of the digital audio signal. This filter is called the reconstruction filter. It is this filter that is very difficult to make without influencing the sound quality. It can even have drastic effects on it. One way to work around it is to record at a higher sampling frequency and use less steep filters. So files at higher sampling rates sound better because it's easier for the DAC or network player to filter. See my video Does 384 kHz sampling make sense for more information? The improvement in sound quality at higher sampling rates is biggest on affordable DACs and players. On top high end DACs and players the difference can be non existing because they use very advanced reconstruction filters that sound close to perfect. Most DAX and players use upsampling where a 44.1 kHz file is taken and samples in between the two original samples are calculated. That way a signal at a higher sampling rate can easily be filtered at a higher frequency so there will be less quality loss in the reconstruction filter, right? Well, to upsample, the signal has to be filtered at half the sampling frequency prior to calculating the in between values. So, upsampling brings no real benefit? Well, that depends. There are computer programs that can upsample your WAV or FLAC files, and since computers have far more computational power than the average DAC chip and don't need to be real time when upsampling files, the upsampling can be done with far more precision than most but not all DACs and players can. The disadvantage is that the files get a lot bigger so you need more storage. Today computers can even do that real time in very high quality provided the algorithm used in the software is of high quality too. The best known program is HQ Player but it is quite tedious to find the optimum setting so be prepared to invest some study and trial time. For more information on upsampling, you could watch my video Q&A Is Upsampling Better? What about MP3 then? Well, MP3 throws away detail, so if you are interested in high quality, don't go there. The advantage of MP3 and the more efficient slash better sounding AAC is that it takes less storage space, down to one tenth of a WAV file. It therefore is a good option for mobile use. I never use MP3 or AAC at home unless there is no other way to get the music I like. But for in the car I convert my flag files to AAC 256 kilobit per second. My car stereo isn't bad 
but the car is a noisy environment and the details I hear at home are fully lost in the car, even when using flak. As you might know, I don't listen to music using in-ears or headphones, but I am sure that for most headphones used on the road AAC 256 is sufficient. Depending on the music, on paper 12 to 14 bits might already be sufficient. A higher bit depth should not further improve the quality. In practice 16 bit is used since it's 2 bytes of information, a byte is 8 bits. Since ICT technology like to think in bytes, the next step is 3 byte or 24 bit and then 4 byte or 32 bits. 24 or 32 bits can be handy during production since it gives room to play with production wise. It gives more headroom since the signal can later be brought up to a higher level. It keeps rounding errors during processing deeper down and thus away from the information and so on. There might also be the reason that 24 bit recordings sound better or more affordable equipment since the simple upsampling found in that equipment has more room to play with. PCM, short for pulse code modulation, is the kind of encoding that is used on CD, WAV, AIFF and FLAC files. I have discussed DSD earlier. Ideally the difference in sound character is very limited, but where one DAC or player will sound better to you with PCM, another DAC or player will sound better to you using DSD. Again here, the higher the quality the DAC or player, the smaller the difference. Larger differences can be due to technical limitation of the hardware, the algorithms used or the deliberate forcing by the manufacturing. Upsampling PCM to DSD can give a better sound quality, but the reverse can also be true. Processing DSD is more processor intensive, so make sure your computer or processor is up to it. In the analog time, measurements were developed to objectively judge the performance of audio equipment. There even was a Deutsche Industrie norm 45500 that defines the qualities hi-fi equipment have to fulfill. A lot of measurements have been developed after that since the DIN 45500 did not explain perceptive quality differences. With digital equipment, the relation between measurements and perceived audio quality is even more difficult since digital signal processing has different effects on the sound quality. On top of that, brain research has proven that the time resolution of our auditory system is clearly higher than thought previously. As mentioned, this has led to very high end DACs that have clearly higher time resolution through the use of very high quality reconstruction filters. And to MQA that uses techniques to make affordable digital audio equipment sound better for the same reason. All measurements done today, for instance with an audio precision like behind me, can give perfect indications on where audio electronics fail, but can't fully explain why a Grim Audio Mu2 sounds better than a Grim Audio Mu1 with a Core Dave. Measurements never explained why certain wines are appreciated for their taste while others aren't. Unless there is foul play, like white wine doped with antifreeze, which really happened. The presence of antifreeze could be proven, not the dislike of the taste. And while there are many people claiming to be able to taste the origin of a given wine, only a limited number of professionals have such high score that their professionalism is credited. But if my wife likes a wine, she simply likes it and enjoys it, wherever it comes from. She follows advice of trusted reviewers and when she found a good one, she sticks to it until no longer available. You could do the same with audio equipment, having the advantage that audio equipment lasts longer than a batch of wine. It probably isn't a sufficient answer for you, but it's the best I can give. And on that bombshell, we come to the end of this video. As usual, there will be a new video next Friday at 5pm Central European time. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to my channel or follow me on Facebook so you will be informed when new videos are out. 
help me reach even more people by giving this video a thumb up or a link to this video on the social media. It is much appreciated. Many thanks to those viewers that support this channel financially. It keeps me independent and lets me improve the channel further. If that makes you feel like supporting my work too, the links are in the comments below this video on YouTube. I'm Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you next week. And whatever you do, enjoy the music.